Hello, welcome everyone. I'm Sonia Yako, Associate Director of Special Collections and University Archives. I'd like to welcome you to this very timely program, bringing the story home, agitating for women's suffrage in New Jersey. I'm going to introduce Dr. Fernanda Perone, who will be introducing our speaker. And I thank you very much for joining us today. Please enjoy. Thank you, Sonia. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for coming to this presentation. This program is part of the statewide celebration of the passage of the 19th Amendment, NJ Women Vote. Please take a look at our special collections and university archives digital exhibition on account of sex, the struggle for women's suffrage in Middlesex County. And I put the address in the chat. Before I introduce our guest speaker, I'll just reiterate um, what James had said that if, if you don't mind keeping off your video and audio and please write questions in the chat and Anne will take the questions at the end of the um, at the end of the presentation and I will monitor them during the presentation. So I am delighted to introduce Dr. Ann Gordon. Andy Gordon is research professor emerita of history at Rutgers University. She has studied the movement to women's suffrage for nearly four decades as an author, editor, and lecturer. Her six volume edition of the selected papers of Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony was published from 1997 to 2013. Towards celebrating women's suffrage at this centennial, her essay on the 19th Amendment appears in the National Park Service's website publication. 19th Amendment and Women's Access to the Vote Across America. She served as a historical advisor to the National Archives in preparing its suffrage centennial exhibit, rightfully hers, and has often spoken on the history of vo voting rights. I first met Ann Gordon in about 1996 when she was editor of the Stanton Anthony Papers. Since then, I sometimes helped her find um, documents and photographs in the Elizabeth Cady Stanton Memorial Collection at Special Collections and University Archives. And over the past two years, I have enjoyed getting to know Anne better through our joint involvement in New Jersey Women Vote. And Unmuting myself. And how do I become the main subject here? Um, good afternoon and welcome to my first ever lecture online. There are going to be some rough spots here, um, but we'll do what we can. In this centennial year, marking 100 years since the 19th Amendment was added to the U.S. Constitution, people have been bringing history home as the exhibit that Fernanda has just described does for New Brunswick and Middlesex County, documenting a social movement that engaged people in all the states and territories as women worked hard to change minds, acquire political skills, and change a fundamental element of American politics. There were famous names aplenty, but none of them, Lucy Stone, Alice Paul, Susan B. Anthony, pick, take your pick, could do that work alone. This is history about citizenship and voting rights, and also about patriarchy. Were women citizens? If they were citizens, how come they couldn't vote? Was voting one of the privileges and immunities of citizenship? Was voting, where did states find the authority to exclude citizens from voting? Who gave men the power to say women were not voters and create a monopoly for themselves? The women in this city and county worked within larger circles of agitation, struggling with those questions. How were activists in New Jersey cutting a pathway to equal political rights? That's today's question. But first, a quick look at this thing called the 19th Amendment that we celebrate. And here you get my first adventure into trying to figure out how to share with you my slide. Okay. 
Here in New Jersey, adult female citizens gained the vote when the 19th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution was ratified in 1920. At that moment, the state constitution still required that to be a voter, one must be a male, 1920. That fact put New Jersey behind the curve. Before ratification, women were voting in all kinds of elections in 16 states, and they were big states like New York, California, Michigan, Washington, Kansas. Um, the, of, of the many maps of suffrage that are available, Sorry, I want to go back to that. Um, there, although this one was somewhat clearer, this was produced for New York State when it had a campaign in 1917. But it shows you the um, the black states are those without suffrage, and the white states have already given women the right to vote by 1917. So there's a lot of women voting before the ratification. They had managed to change the laws of their state governments, which we here in New Jersey, women were not able to accomplish. For states like New Jersey, Pennsylvania was in the same predicament by the power of the federal government overrode that constitutional language. The amendment said that, the amendment said that the states could no longer use the word male to limit access to the ballot. The amendment did not give women a right to vote. We don't have that yet, as you might have noticed in the news. Despite needing federal intervention to achieve the vote for women in New Jersey, for women, New Jersey has a full and complicated history of woman suffrage agitation. Indeed, New Jersey has a very important claim in the American history of voting rights. In this state, between 1776 and 1807, white women African-American men and African-American women could vote in the colony and later state, provided they possessed the necessary sum of money. This is the language of the Constitution. All inhabitants would get, if they met these conditions, they could vote. This historical anomaly began on July 2nd, 1776, when delegates to a provincial Congress meeting in Burlington adopted a resolution, um, adopted a resolution, a, adopted a constitution in advance of the Declaration of Independence. They were about to have to become a state and need a new constitution. They chose the word, historians debate to this day whether it was an intentional act on the part of the men who wrote that constitution to say nothing of race or gender. They chose the word inhabitants, a word about being alive in a particular place. Whatever their plan, legislation written in the 1790s made it perfectly clear that in these parts, voters were he or she, that's language from laws passed in New Jersey, and lists of voters survived that bear the names of women who actually voted. We even have a song. We probably need a t-shirt. What um, I'll give you, I won't try to sing it, but I'll give you the final stanza. This is from 1797. What though we read in days of yore, the women's occupation was to direct the wheel and loom and not direct the nation. This narrow-minded policy by us has met detection. While woman's bound, men can't be free nor have a fair election. This era of women voting in New Jersey ended in 1807 by a legislative act. Thereafter, to be an eligible voter in New Jersey, one needed to be a citizen, a white person, and a male. Three changes. In the usual order of things, changes to constitutions require constitutional amendments, a formal procedure with the, com with the consent of some portion of the electorate. Yet here, citizens were deprived of constitutional rights by a legislative majority in a room full of white men. In the words of a hardworking suffragist lawyer in the 20th century, this was, quote, an uprising of men against women. That law of 1807 protected the concentration of power in the hands of white males until New Jersey wrote a new constitution in 1844. And that changed nothing. The new constitution limited the consent of the governed to that same narrow group. Thus began 
a special history of New Jersey of taking suffrage away from people. Memories of those three decades of voting lingered when New Jersey called that constitutional convention in 1844, the disfranchised were heard from. Petitions from what the records, record calls colored citizens were received, quote, praying that they may not be excluded by the Constitution from exercising the right of suffrage. Their pleas were tabled. From Burlington County came a petition of, quote, sundry inhabitants asking that the right of suffrage be extended to women. It too was tabled. But here were early appeals for equal political rights. The precedent of the women voting, I think, worried anti-suffragists. The first historical account of this era was delivered as a talk to members of the New Jersey Historical Society in January 1858 by one William Whitehead. Why in the winter of 57 and 58 did this man turn his attention to this subject? He was intent on proving that the words were about all inhabitants were no big deal. He found no evidence of women taking advantage of the laws, he claimed, no voting at all by women, and then he gave his game away. Quote, we are warranted in believing that the women of New Jersey then as now were not about to overstep the bounds of decorum or intrude where their characteristic modesty and self-respect might be wounded. He is in effect warning off women who might be tempted by a movement for women's rights that was growing considerably in the mid-Atlantic states by the late 1850s. New Jersey really becomes a player in the suffrage movement immediately after the Civil War, not only taking steps in the state, but also linking up with what was emerging as a national movement. While senators and members of Congress were agonizing and strategizing about how the federal government would protect former slaves in their new freedom, reformers across the northern states considered whether changes should be made in state constitutions. Would the northern states remove the requirement that voters be white? And then came the obvious next question. Why not remove mail at the same time? How intensely these goals were pursued varied widely across the country. In Michigan and New York, reformers carried the ideas all the way to constitutional conventions in 1867 and 1871. In Kansas, the ideas were sent to the voters on referenda, white men voting whether to share power with women and with black men in 1867. No on both counts. In the territory of Wyoming, women were simply given their voting rights in 1869. So simple, such common sense. At this moment, Lucy Stone was a key figure in New Jersey. Granted a hearing before a legislative committee on March 4th, 1867, which in itself is probably a measure of how seriously people are beginning to take these conversations, she explained the aims of those working together with her in the American Equal Rights Association. And I quote her, women ask you to submit to the people of New Jersey amendments to the constitution of the state, striking out respectively the words white and male from article two, section one, thus enfranchising the women and the colored men who jointly constitute a majority of our adult citizens. You will thereby establish a Republican form of government. She goes on later in the speech, quoting the state constitution, if, quote, all political par power is inherent in the people, words from the Constitution, why have women who are more than half the entire population of this state no political existence? Is it because they are not people? Only a madman would say of a congregation of Negroes or of women that there are no people here. After telling the history of women voting in New Jersey's early days, Stone went on, women come before you here in New Jersey with a peculiar and special claim. We have had this right. We have exercised it. It has been unjustly and illegally taken away without our consent, without us being allowed to say a word in our own defense. 
There was not much more that women could say over the next 50 years. Lucy had landed on almost every point there was. Members of the special committee that heard Stone's speech and received her petition were in fact moved. They reported that the question of women's suffrage should go to the voters of the state. Quote, your committee failed to discover any reason why women should not vote. They pay taxes to support the government and are subject to all its laws. Yet taxation without representation, we all agree, is tyranny. Nonetheless, the assembly tabled that committee report. The national discussion about citizenship and voting rights produced other demonstrations by women seeking uh, seeking equal political rights in those early years of reconstruction. Direct action by women became a thing from coast to coast. Show up to register to vote. Try going to the polls. Occasionally cast a ballot without objection. They let it in. Here women might here in New Jersey women might call it action to restore their stolen rights. Or they might claim what women in any state could claim. The 14th Amendment, by making them citizens, made them voters. Portia Gage of, of Vineland kicked things off in New Jersey when she tried to vote in a local election in March of 1868. A few months later in Passaic, at an election for a commissioner of streets and sidewalks, according to the one New York City newspaper, a group of women actually voted. Presumably they were taxpayers who were paying for those streets and sidewalks. In the November election that year, still in 68, Lucy Stone and her mother-in-law tried to vote in Roseville. Back in Vineland that month, Portia Gay led 172 women to the polls and they cast their ballot in a ballot box of their own. It is said that this is a blueberry crate they were using. This is the ballot, this is the box. The numbers grew, 182 women at the local election in 1869 and 214 in that year's November election. On beyond these New Jersey stories, women in several states sued when they were denied registration as voters. One of those instances went to the US Supreme Court from Missouri. In the same era, Susan B. Anthony got away with voting and was then indicted and convicted of a federal crime. This is all part of the same movement. Another post-war tactic in the states was to seek what was called partial suffrage, a limited access to politics, voting on very particular things. Kansas happened to be a leader in this. It started with women voting on liquor licenses, on matters of public education, and eventually by the 1880s, voting in municipal elections. Women all over the country worked to get these bits and pieces of political power. At least, at a minimum, they could demonstrate their interest in voting. When the New Jersey legislature finally passed a law allowing women to vote at school meetings in village and county school districts, and that's very particular language we'll come back to, meetings, village, County. In 1887, the state became the 19th or 20th, it's hard to get the exact count, one, one to allow women some vote in public education. No woman living in a city had this right. In cities, the business of public education was conducted at polling places and meetings where women might have voted were not held convenient. Women, white and black, took advantage of this small political opportunity and showed up at meetings for seven years without noticeable difficulty. The State Suffrage Association and the Women's Christian Temperance Union, which was becoming a very important part of New Jersey's suffrage fight, um, both, both groups collected data on women's participation in the school suffrage. They wanted to establish the interest and the need. Reporting to a national organization at the start of 1894, the two groups said they'd heard of women taking part in school meetings in Burlington, Camden, Cumberland, Monmouth, Essex, and Sussex counties. At Vineland, they learned, quote, the larger proportion of the voters were women. And to the north, quote, about one fourth of those who attended five school meetings at East Orange were women. In 1894, after that report, this limited right came under attack. 
Trouble began when the legislature passed a bill granting women who owned property in newly created road districts, we're back to that topic, the opportunity to vote for district road commissioners. Eligible women cast their ballots. And in a case originating in Englewood Township, the courts were asked to weigh in. Could the legislature alter the electorate, that is admit women to vote, for this special purpose? Or did such a change require a constitutional amendment? The state's chief justice saw no reason to be flexible. On June 11, 1894, he ruled that none but male citizens, um, none but male citizens with property in the road district could elect road commissioners. He reasoned thus, in prescribing who was qualified to vote in the state, that provision, white male citizens, New Jersey's 1844 Constitution applied those rules to, quote, all officers that now are or hereafter may be elective by the people. This is from the New York Times right after that decision, the day, the date line, the day of that decision. Although the justice said nothing about school elections in his decision, it was assumed immediately that a connection existed. Reporting the decision, the Times predicted innumerable contests there at the bottom of the article. It took only a month for a town to bar women from voting for trustees at a school meeting in Vineland on July 27th, in Vineland no less. The state superintendent charged the state superintendent was on the side of women here. He charged Vineland's county superintendent with acting in violation of the law of 1887. This case worked its way in a very tangled way to the state Supreme Court. And surprise, the court ruled on November 8th, 1894, that school trustees were in fact officers elected by the people in the meaning of the state constitution and thus to be elected only by male citizens. After seven years, the right was gone on a narrow interpretation of the state government. At this moment, when the state was once has once again taken the ballot away from women, the second time, remember, it is possible by looking at some reports of suffrage meetings to hear how women weighed where to put their energies and resources next. And with the evidence we have here comes about because the meetings, the suffrage organization has become much better organized and also nationally. Lucy Stone has had established an important newspaper in Boston, Women's Journal, and the New Jersey associations are reporting to her. Their corresponding secretary would send up a report. So we end up knowing much more about what's happening as women sit around and plot what on earth to do next. They had to answer with what, what um, should they take a path suggested by the court's opinion and fight for an amendment that would restore their right to vote for school trustees? Or was this the moment to go big, to fight for an amendment that would restore full suffrage? Listen in on meetings in 1895, months after the judge's decision. Start in Newark's YMCA on January 25th at a special meeting of the State Suffrage Association. I believe it was called because of the judge's decision. And you'll hear in this some names of some pretty distinguished suffragists from New Jersey um, who, were, who are the speakers in these meetings. Mrs. Jenny DeWitt moved that the legislature be petitioned to amend the state constitution by striking out the word male from the qualifications for voters. Mrs. E.L. Blackwell thought we might be more hopeful of success if we only tried to regain school suffrage. Mrs. L.H. Rowan thought we should not humble ourselves to ask for anything less than full suffrage. Mrs. Celia B. Whitehead believed if we asked for anything less than full suffrage, we give up the principle of equal rights with men. They're in a dilemma. We learn that these women do not agree about how far to push their political points. 
but more than one person in this room perceives a push for school suffrage to be kind of humiliating, an acceptance of inequality. Go to another meeting in Newark when the State Association gathered on April 2nd. There we'll hear Mary Hussey from a very distinguished multi-generational suffrage family in New Jersey. Mary Hussey report from the Executive Committee on the petition to the legislature for full suffrage. The petition was headed by a protest, she announced, for women had voted in New Jersey until it was unconstitutionally taken from them in 1807. So they went ahead with the full suffrage petition with that protest attached. Now to Plainfield in the morning of May 10th in the city's new YMCA building. This was the founding meeting of the Union County Woman Suffrage Association. I said structure, they're building, they're expanding. Helped along by and affiliated with the newly revived New Jersey Woman Suffrage Association whose leaders were in attendance. Just before a break for lunch, the corresponding secretary reported the state president, Florence Howe Hall, generations again, that's Julia Ward Howe's daughter, Florence Hall read the petition for an extension of school suffrage and urged members to take copies of it and secure names. We've got both drives going on. But now step back. In these three meetings within five months of each other, we have a hyper-local movement for women's suffrage that is expanding, becoming well-organized. We also have not one word about the federal government or about amending the federal constitution. These men and women in New Jersey are be dealing with local history while pursuing suffrage. They fought for a constitutional amendment to restore that tiny bit of suffrage for school suffrage, and they lost that fight at an election in 1897. Enormous resources going at it. 15 years passed before New Jersey suffragists had the chance to pursue the bigger prize, an amendment that would enfranchise them for all elections held. It was all the steps. Measure has to get through two successive legislatures and then persuade those pesky voters going out to the people the male people, whether or not to amend the state constitution to allow women to vote was made a question for a special election set for October 19th, 1915. To change, to change state constitutions was the oldest method that what women had been trying to do and started trying to do in the states in the 1840s, this map again to help make it clear. And it was successful in many states. Faced with a recalcitrant Congress by 1915 and a Democratic president who stood in the way of federal action, going for the state solution was a strategic alternative. It was also an ideological alternative. It played into convictions about states' rights. Let's get this done, it said, without federal interference. There was a cluster of state uh, referenda that fall in the hope that at least one state in the Northeast might be moved to the woman suffrage column. With its October date, New Jersey would lead the parade. In November, voters in New York, Massachusetts, and Pennsylvania cast their ballots on state amendments too. With so much writing nationally on the outcomes of these elections, national organizers were sent in to assist local leaders. And New Jersey's activists led an intense mobilization with rallies and speaking tours, anything to educate male voters and demonstrate that women wanted this change. In the campaign of 1915, we can see very clearly in the evidence that black and white women were collaborating. Meet, meet Miss, um, just to a blank, Miss Blanche, Mrs. Blanche Harris. Um, to give one example of the kinds of activities that were going on and the intensity of their work, from the Bridgewater Courier News, September 27th, 1915, a partially, I'm quoting partially, I'm paraphrasing, a big suffrage rally will be held at Nonpareil Hall this evening at 8.30 p.m. Goes on to tell who's speaking, the Reverend William Lloyd Imus, 
who recently took charge of the Bethel Chapel in Plainfield, Mrs. Blanche Harris, president of the Colored Branch of the Women's Political Union in Newark, who had, quote, won many converts in Newark by her eloquence, and then the other named participant, a Democratic politician from Bridgewater. Harris is clearly traveling around in this campaign. In the suffrage movement, when you found a woman who could stir up a crowd, you put her on the road to speak, not just in her own town, but wherever stirring up was needed. The newspaper took care to signal that this event welcomed white and black without quite saying that. Local readers could recognize would recognize that Plainfield's Bethel Chapel was an African-American church. Still there if you want to look for it. Mrs. Harris presided over the colored branch of a suffrage group. And the named politician came from one of the oldest German families in the Bridgewater area. It's an integrated meeting. The same practice in language recurred the next day when the paper reported very briefly on a successful event. In that follow-up report, Blanche, Blanche Harris earned high praise, but unfortunately no one's speech was reported. This is just one of hundreds of events women organized in the lead up to that October election to get their constitution amendment amended. On election day, Will, Woodrow Wilson traveled to New Jersey to cast his vote. This is one of my favorite headlines. Uh, he came to press his vote. He cast his vote in Princeton. It was a big event. Women met him at the train, escorted him to his polling station. It was a grand display. He did come to vote, yes. But on the same day, and the New York Times decided to put in the same headline, his fiance made had a press conference in Washington to announce that she was opposed to woman suffrage. Pressing for, oh, sorry, no, I didn't mean to do that, but it doesn't matter. Um, but pressing for equal rights was not all display or pleasure. Activists for suffrage were by now quite knowledgeable about the ways of politics. And one of the precautions they took ahead of the election was to have women trained as poll watchers, black and white, both. Over a thousand polls apparently were covered by women as poll watchers. But listen to this. We have Atlantic City, October 19th, 1915 from the New York Times. Negro women as suffrage watchers at polling places are thought to have lost votes for the amendment here, either because watchers were scarce or for some political reasons, the Negro women were much in evidence and many white voters were heard to express disapproval of their presence. According to responsible citizens, many voted against suffrage for this reason who might have favored the amendment. One has to assume responsible citizens is code for white ones. But what point is the Times trying to make here? We know the paper opposed woman suffrage. Is it trying to scare white people away from woman suffrage because black people want it? How come the reporter never spoke to those colored Negro suffrage watchers? Among the many oddities of this report, that according to the censuses, African Americans made up above 20% of Atlantic City's population. For comparison's sake, New Brunswick black population was 3.4, Camden was 7.3. If there weren't Negroes at the polling place in Atlantic City at 20% population, some, that's what would have been wrong, not this. And it's a very sad part of the keeping track of history that we have no idea who those women were um, unless somebody can dig further and figure it out. The women in that 1915 election suffered a massive loss, a margin of, of 50, 000, over 50,000 votes. In Newark, 65% of voters said no. 
in yet for some reason in uh, it's said that in 126 towns and cities voters did say yes statewide only 42 percent of of the male voters assented to change to let women in only one county said yes ocean county and boy were they proud they were using that right up through 1920 in their favor <clears throat> On the cover of this 1916 issue of The Suffragist, and I don't know how well you can read it, the caption down here, Mr. Wilson believes, Mr. Wiss, Mr. Wilson believes in women's suffrage for New Jersey. He's drawing a circle around New Jersey with her parasol here. I never thought of Wills, Woodrow Wilson as as limber as this is drawing him. This is the group, the three women over here, one's called Middle States, one's called New England, one's called Southern States. But what, what Nina Allender, the artist, a member of the National Women's Party, and this is the National Women's Party's paper, is making a case for a federal amendment. She's mocking Wilson's grand gesture of suffrage support in that 1915 referendum in New Jersey. Women in other states, the artist makes clear, remain outside his magic circle. When this issue went to press late in September 1916, Wilson had been declaring over and over again that he remained committed to state action. In a private letter to August, in August 1916, he explained, I have all along believed and still believed that the thing can best and most solidly be done by the action of the individual states and that the time it will take to get it that way will not be longer than the time it would take to get it the other way, that is, by federal amendment. This is more than a little disingenuous. Women had already been trying to win suffrage by the action of individual states for more than 50 years. President Wilson did change his mind or his tactics. By January 18, he, in his role as leader of the Democratic Party, urged members of Congress to, quote, vote for the amendment as an act of right and justice to the women of the country and of the world. His advice made a difference, though it was not the only change occurring. Congress had more and more members who had been elected in states where women voted. Remember, that's 1917. That many count the senators and the representatives. At long last, some members of Congress were accountable to women. A federal amendment needs first to gain the support of two thirds of the members in both houses of Congress. Suffragists came close to their target in 1918, and that was a signal to activate in, activists in the states to prepare for that next step when legislatures in the states would need to approve the amendment. Here in New Jersey, women formed a committee for ratification presided over by the leaders of the New Jersey Women's Suffrage Association, Lillian Feichert, and the New Jersey Federation of Women's Women Clubs. What's happening? Um, Florence Randolph. In the nation's capital, the all important votes were held. In the House of Representatives, the amendment was finally approved on May 21st, 1919. The Senate followed on June 4th. On to the states. The most popular story about ratification of the 19th Amendment is that of Tennessee, where on August 18th, 1920, young Harry Byrne received a letter from his mother while he was in the legislative session considering the amendment and following her direction he cast the deciding vote in the deciding state that ratified the amendment it's a charming story but it takes attention away from the heavy lifting done by women elsewhere in those months after congress approved the amendment ratification of the 19th amendment in new jersey was never a sure thing until the last day the ratification committee here acted like skilled politicians. It was an election year for the legislature, and the women were out pressing candidates to pledge support for the amendment, working the political parties for, to, for suffrage planks in their platforms, counting votes in each chamber of the legislature, 
circulating a petition to women across the state and calling a massive rally in Trenton while legislators debated the amendment. Opponents had time to prepare too, and the trick in New Jersey was to insist that the legislators needed advice from constituents. Another referendum would be required. That became the political platform of the state's Republican Party. That quote, that the question of ratification of the woman suffrage amendment be determined by a referendum vote of the voters of the state of New Jersey. The local chapter of, National Associ of the National Association opposed to women's suffrage took the identical position. The chair of that group's legislative committee pleaded with the governor. As reported in the national magazine of the opposed group, um, the woman patriot, her letter to the governor of New Jersey pointed to the state's history. Quote, after 30 years experience of woman's suffrage, the state rescinded it in 1807. Then in 1897, she continued a form of woman suffrage was defeated by 10,000 votes. That's that school defeating the school suffrage amendment. Quote, and in 1915, full suffrage was defeated by a majority of 51,108 votes. As in view of this record, the people of New Jersey stand opposed to woman suffrage. We feel that they should be heard before action is taken by the legislature. And this was not the only kind of problem. New Jersey had an odd record with respect to federal amendments. Taking all the amendments from 1865 to 1918, that's numbers 13 through 18, only once was New Jersey counted among the requisite number of states to ratify. They'd vote, they'd rescind, they'd delay, they'd vote again, they'd reject. As the state government website tells it, in four instances, New Jersey ratified only after the amendments were approved. In other words, they got on board with an established fact. These included, believe it or not, the abolition of slavery, the federal income tax, the prohibition of alcohol. But the legis but it was eight, but it was also 2003 when New Jersey got around to approving the 14th Amendment that had been in the Constitution since 1868. The 15th Amendment was the template for the 19th. It left the power of states to determine who could qualify to vote, but it laid down rules for states to follow, in that case, race, color, previous condition of servitude in the 15th. Exactly the same kind of intervention that would occur if the 19th were ratified. New Jersey rejected the 15th Amendment in March 1870, just before it was ratified. It was a year later when this state decided to get on board that train. The ratification committee called a huge rally for January 26th in Trenton. As indication of the national importance of events in Trenton, Carrie Chapman Catt, president of the National American Woman Suffrage Association, delivered a stirring speech. Mrs. Fiker called out each county one by one to present the petitions of women who wanted to vote. The governor with his wife and daughter attended along with some friendly legislators. It was reported that in all, 122,478 women had signed petitions, 5,000 of them from Middlesex County. Ocean County said that since we voted correctly in 1915, we don't need to do the petition. You all know where we stand. The state Senate passed the amendment overwhelmingly, 18 yeas to two nays, at an evening session on February 2nd. In the assembly, anti-suffragists pressed for a vote on the referendum to occur before members voted on the federal amendment. There was a way to block the vote on the amendment. On February 3rd, the House Committee on Federal Relations held a hearing on the amendment. It lasted three hours. Lillian Feichert and Florence Randolph were both among the speakers. And so was a representative of the local chapter of the association opposed to woman suffrage. In the assembly, the, the Democratic leader was stalling right up until the last minute, 
trying, quote, every parliamentary scheme he could devise to halt the passage of ratification this morning, as the Perth Amboy paper described it. And each little thing would cause call for a roll call vote so that it would get longer and longer and longer. On February 9th, the assembly finally passed the 19th amendment by a vote of 34 to 24. The next morning, Ms. Clara Vezin, I'm not positive of that pronunciation, legislative chair of the anti-suffragists was still protesting the lack of a referendum and arguing for states' rights. Representative government in New Jersey has been repudiated by the New Jersey legislature, she told the press. In some states, politicians took up the tasks of rewording their constitutions right away when this change occurred. Get the word mail out. But not New Jersey. It was like some token they were keeping to remind them of the good old days. Female citizens here started voting in 1920, but the Constitution went on saying mail until 1947. Never underestimate the complexities of our federal system. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, and I'd like to wish we could give you a virtual round of applause. <laughs> um, but I hope you'll take some questions. Indeed. I actually have a question myself. I'll use my prerogative. <laughs> um, so I read in the in the home news that in about 1888, I have to double check the date. There were 16 women in New Brunswick including the mayor's wife who voted on the location of a school, whether it should be on French Street or Somerset Street. I'm just wondering how that, I know most of the voting in the school suffrage area was in uh, villages and rural areas. That How do you explain that voting in New Brunswick? I can't, there is one, I can add one thing to, the details I gave before, which was that even after the Supreme Court said, no, you can't, you know, no, they can't do this. Um, women could still vote on money. It turned out that the real issue was they were electing what were called school trustees, and that's the officers that the state constitution said only men could vote for. So in t villages and towns, people were still able, but I don't, I don't get the impression that it was an enthusiastic continuation, um, but they could still vote on budgets. Um, but why they could vote in New, Jer in New Brunswick, I don't know, because New Brunswick should not have been, maybe they held a meeting, maybe you could trick the law by holding a meeting and then it would have worked, I don't know. That's a good, that's a puzzlement. Yeah. Um, thank you. So as far as other questions, somebody asked they could have a transcript of your talk or if you were planning to publish it. Um, I wasn't planning to publish it, but you're recording it. So that becomes a way people could get at it, doesn't it? Yeah. yeah. And I'm hoping to put it in the library's YouTube um, channel. Um, so we have somebody who's asking, what accounted for the progressive attitude of the St. County residents? <laughs> They're not just known for that progressive <laughs> attitude right now. Um, no, there's a person after my own heart, because that was the first question I asked. I had the census out, I was doing it. I don't know. Um, what does stand out if you look, it's, Ocean County was very small. It was second only to Sussex County, it's the smallest in the, in the state at the time. At the time. Um, it also, it's very heavily native born whites. Um, that doesn't always result in being pro-suffrage, but it was the only characteristic of the county I could find. Um, 
So I don't know. And what somebody could probably do sometime, I don't even know if Ocean County had its own newspaper, but one might be able to figure out, are there people living there who were more active than others? And if it's a small county, you know, if you had a really strong group of feisty women, they might have been able to really drum up support for the cause. Um, I, I suggest some student take up this topic and see what you can figure out um, as to who lives there by names. I don't just mean demographic, but are there leading suffragists in that county and are there organizations that they're working through um, that might account for it? Uh, thank you. Um, let's see, are there any other questions? A lot of people are saying, thank you. Excellent presentation and really enjoyed it. Someone mentioned there's a, um, in March, there was a special issue of the magazine garden state legacy on women's suffrage in New Jersey. Mm -hmm. uh, if you want to get a hold of that. I was interested in uh, Blanche Harris. I actually just just learned about her in a presentation last night, which oh, is about the Newark. Did you watch the Newark History Society once? <laughs> Newark History Society, and that the that the Women's uh, Political Union of, of Newark actually had a separate. Uh, col they called it the Colored Women's Section, and I, I didn't know that. That was very interesting. Um, when I heard, uh, I first learned about her because I was working on a national committee with somebody at Penn, and included a woman at Penn State, and she knew that I'd been looking at to find African American suffragists in New Jersey, and she sent me this uh, that very article I was talking about. She, I don't know how she found it. She wasn't working on New Jersey, but she was working on African American suffragists, and she sent me the clipping, and then she also. Um, compulsively researched it and started sending me other bits and pieces. Um, what I picked up when the New Newark History Society presentation the other night um, talked about her was not only did you not know that existed, but that it's not part of the history of the National Women's Party. Somebody, you know, sometimes got to work on that. She also was working, Blanche was also working closely with the um, Republican, she was part of a colored Republican organization. And eventually she's credited later in life with being um, responsible for the election of the first African-American member of the legislature. Um, you know, that she became really a good mobilizer organizer in Newark. Okay, so we're gonna have to were you aware of other uh, branches or organizations, colored women suffrage groups? Um, I mean, I know the um, many of the colored women's club, the so-called colored women's clubs, supported suffrage from early on. But as far as groups that, and the certainly the um, the Federation of Colored Women's Clubs endorsed suffrage. But as far as other groups specifically for suffrage I'm not aware of. Are you aware of any, Anne? In the state, I mean, what I've gathered from um, Betty Adams, who's done a lot of work on this, I mean, not Betty Adams, um, what's Betty's last name? Somebody help me. Um, the, the, Betty Adams, yes. The, what's her last name again? Adams. <laughs> it, it is Adams, okay. Um, the, um, Betty Adams is that a lot of the, she thinks that a lot of the, she's worked on the question of black women and suffrage in New Jersey. And she thinks that a lot of the activism was being channeled through the Women's Christian Temperance Union. Um, and uh, so that that becomes, and from 1876 onward, it's, you, it's okay to advocate women's suffrage in the Christian, Women's Christian Temperance Union, but I think it's decided locally. Maybe it's decided by state, but it's not thought to be in violation of the national organization's practices. Um, so that's 
I don't know of others that being obviously they get as soon as women have the vote, they get inside as Blanche Harris does inside um, political organizations. And I know I wasn't surprised about her Republican convention, Republican connection that they had a women's organization and she's in charge of it because that that happens in a lot of places in the country that in the 1920s in certain locations, politicians move very quickly to recruit the top people in their in their state or their city uh, who have proven themselves to be good organizers. Okay, a question for Ron Becker, who's asking about the, um, the suffrage, the support for suffrage and violence, if you can say a bit more about that. Um, he's actually, he's from Vineland, as many of you know, originally. Oh, okay. Um, so, well, in the 1960s, we used to say that, you know, that the, when you picked up them at some point in American history, the, the United States map was picked up and tipped over and all the nuts rolled into California, we used to say. Well, in New Jersey, it's like that happened. They all drifted down to the southern part of the state. Um, Vineland is... Uh, it's an, as I understand it, it was an intentional community. That is, somebody got land, recruited people, brought people in to live there. And, um, but it's where spiritualists in New Jersey live. It's where dress reformers in New Jersey live. It's where alternative medicine people in New Jersey live. Not, they're not exclusively, but it's, it's got everything going on in 19th century reform terms. And so, and then I think there's also a, there probably, but I'm not, I didn't double check this, um, a strong Quaker presence. And the advantage Quakers had was that they had equal rights inside their denomination. And so you find women, they've been able to speak for the Quakers, so they know how to speak to public. They know how to lead. They know all kinds of things like this. So that becomes where um, they would have also been in close contact with the Philadelphia crew of anti-slavery activist women, very important group of anti-slavery women in Philadelphia, um, as well as strong members of the Quake uh, Society of Friends there too. So. It's um, and I think there's there's probably pop. I'm pretty sure I've known in the past that there's, um, you know, members of families in Philadelphia and in Vineland who would have been back and forth communicating and sharing conversations and ideas. Thank you. And people are writing interesting things in the chat. Um, there's a new book about um, how women of color transformed. The suffrage movement by Catherine D. Cahill. Yeah, Catherine's the person I was talking about who sent me the Blanche Harris clipping first. <laughs> yes. So that's we supposed to be coming out in November. Yeah, it should be terrific. She's a terrific historian and um, was uh, the committee I was on. She could solve all our problems because she knew so much. <laughs> I recommend people look for it. And somebody posted a link about some of women's activities in Ocean County, if anybody wants to follow oh. up with that. So that's very interesting. Um, Sometimes messages are visible to me and most of the time they're not, it's mysterious. Yeah, if you see one, let me know. Oh, someone asked about how involved was Alice Paul in New Jersey? I know she was more involved at the national level. Um, I don't have the impression, I don't want to get into a fight with the Alice Paul Institute people, but um, I don't have the impression that she is very involved in New Jersey itself. Her organization though, when they, at that point of working for the ratification with how, with, you know, where people were worried about New Jersey, people were sending in, and it's my understanding that some of the National Women's Party people were in New Jersey then to help out. Um, whether Alice, I have never seen reference to Alice herself being here, but that could just be my sources. Um, and that some 
that somebody's got evidence to the contrary. Is if there's a Alice Paul scholar in the room, you know, speak up. Actually, I just wanted me to put in another plug for our new digital exhibit on women and women's suffrage in Middlesex County. And I'll, I'll put the link in the chat again. And I, I really enjoyed working on the exhibit and I realized how much of a local story it really is. And you could probably look at women in every county in New Jersey and mm -hmm. come up with, um, with more people, more organizations, more activities. Most of the work is, has focused, a lot is focused on Newark, Jersey City, um, the better known organizations, Plantfield. So there's still a lot of work to be done if anyone is um, looking for a topic. <laughs> Oh, I see Gail Momgreen, who used to work with me, um, is asking, why do I think Woodrow Wilson changed his mind? I don't know. There are people who have worked on it really hard. Um, but one of the arguments that's given is that he, the Republicans were getting very, were threatening. Um, there's a very cynical telegram he wrote somebody about, you know, oh, they'll mess it up, those Republicans, they always do. But he's taking note of the fact that they're pushing harder for the federal amendment and so getting his own people, you know, to not be the defeated side may be important. And then somebody, I've seen somebody argue that the, um, that the fact that he's an international leader, the whole argument, one of the arguments made in all those protests in Washington, and the chan chaining themselves to the White House fence and so forth, is that he's telling the rest of the world they need democracy while having this problem back home. So they're they're trying to play that international um, image problem, and I think that. And, and so some people argue that it's beginning to get to him. He's got, uh, you know, he's got to do something. And it looks like maybe he noticed that uh, in New Jersey, his strategy failed, um, that they couldn't get the vote through. So it, it wasn't true that it was going to be faster than a federal amendment. Um, but I I think there, there was a book um, uh, written a long time ago uh, Christine Lenardini, that she was very well informed on Wilson. I know that because she was working at the Wilson papers when I was. Um, but she was very, so she had very good grasp of the, you know, all the evidence on Wilson. And she does take up that topic in her book. So somebody pointed out that New Jersey did have a chapter of the Congressional Union which later became the New Jersey um, branch of the Women's Party. And there were a couple of women from Morristown, Alice Turnbull Hopkins, um, who, who was involved in that. So, so there certainly was, um, but it was a much smaller, much, much smaller organization than New Jersey Women's Suffrage Association was really the, the biggest in New Jersey. Mm -hmm. Although the Women's Political Union had a lot of uh, influence too. And there's also another factor, a weird factor. People may have heard that, that much is made of the fact that the suffrage movement split into two after the Civil War. And New Jersey, in the 19th, it affects the 19th century actions of New Jersey suffragists a great deal. They go with the American Woman Suffrage Association that believes in state action. That's Lucy Stone's group. Lucy leaves the state and moves to New Boston, but she's still in touch with and she's got relatives still in New Jersey that are influencing. And so they're they're paying almost no attention. Lucy Stone literally disapproved of the federal amendment for many decades. And so the, the New Jersey influence, the emphasis in their lives has been state action. How it affects the 20th century, I haven't figured out. I don't I don't know whether it but it could be 
that this, what you're describing, Fernanda, about proportions and that it's the larger organization, could be that that's kind of a way it settles down. That, all right, we're going to go with the federal amendment now, us New Jersey Women's Suffrage Association people, but, um, but it's, you know, but it's new to us. <laughs> so. so, does anyone else have more questions? I, I'm glad you saw the question from Gail because I didn't even see it. Well, that's this mystery of the thing of, <laughs> of what, what I get to see and what I don't get to see. Okay, there's a question. Could you talk about Elizabeth T. Stanton's time in New Jersey? <laughs> Here, I thought I was going to get away with not being a Stanton person today. Um, <laughs> having spent 30, nearly 40 years of my life being <laughs> studying Stanton and Anthony. Um, Stanton has one wonderful thing that I had to cut out because my talk was getting too long about how when she moves to New Jersey, she's giving up because the taxes in New York are just getting too high and she's going to move to New Jersey. But then she discovers that in New Jersey, this is 1870, I think she writes this, 1869, um, and discovers that in New Jersey, a married woman isn't even allowed to write her will. Um, and this was true. Because and so then she talks about how here she spent the previous 30 years, 25 years, whatever, um, trying to change all such laws in New York State, and she's got it done. So now she'll just take it to New Jersey and try to get it done there. And um, that's how she announces her move to New Jersey. Um, when she's here, she's not really in the state very much because she moves here just as her career as a national lecturer um, come, uh, starts, launches, and she's on the road for months and months and months at a time. The kids are sent off to boarding school and colleges, um, and I don't know with whether she had a maid sitting in the house to protect it or she just left it empty. Um, but she's got, I've teased the antenna fly that the, you know, the, the best place to mark Stanton's presence in their town is that railroad station, because that's the one and she was in it and in and out of it all the time. Um, what she does do, we know is in 1880, rather whimsically, she goes and tries to cast a vote. What happened is the, the, um, Republican Party sent around a wagon to pick up the voters at their houses, um, something that's now being disputed as possibly illegal in some states, um, but to, to transport voters to the polls. Um, but they came to her house and none of her sons or her husband was home. And Susan B. Anthony was staying with her. They were working on writing the history of women's suffrage and they decide to get into the, they go into the wagon and as the Republican Party takes them downtown to the polling place. <clears throat> um, and they're, of course, turned down, and then she can write lots of, th you know, sarcastic, funny things about it afterwards. Um, it's an odd thing. I'd say it's whimsical because nowhere in the country was anybody doing that, that for the 1880 election. So it's not like part of a movement the way the Vineland and uh, Virginia Minor and Susan B. Anthony of the early um, late 60s, early 70s is. And there is an attempt, I think, of some women in 84, but, you know, she's, she's on a lark, I think. Um, and it doesn't really have any, she doesn't sue about it. You know, it just, it's fun. That's what, and Stanton liked to fun, liked to have fun. Um, but I don't think she has much impact on the state's activity. For one thing, she and Lucy Stone, by the time Stanton moves here, she and Lucy Stone can't be in the same room together. So um, she's not, and the people that, she speaks in Vineland uh, before she moves to New Jersey, she's down in Vineland speaking, but she doesn't have much say over the, or with, over or with the New Jersey suffragists. There's another question. Um, I, know, I know there's documentation of women voting before 1807. Is there documentation of African Americans voting before 1807 as well, since they were also included in that, you know, when it's a vote? 
You know, I'm sorry not to know. I do. I know that somebody at the state archives once told me that they were pretty sure they'd identified African American. You know, what's it going to say? It's the problem we have any time we're looking at historic records, unless they're the kind that put parentheses colored after it. How do we know that that person is an African American? Um, I don't know whether anybody's further research than that casual conversation I had with somebody at the archives. The place to look these days would be at the Constitution Center, who's done a lot of work on the New Jersey situation and has had a lot more money than state agencies have to look into it and research it. So I would check their websites. Um, and I think they have a podcast that's still available and you know, it's a recorded one you can go get on the um, on the New Jersey situation. They're much more likely if identification has been made, they're the people who are most likely to know it, I think. Actually, they're having a big exhibit about um, yeah. early voting. And they've, they've found a lot of evidence like electoral rolls from different counties yeah, somebody just pointed out uh, that there is at least one African American who voted. Yeah, that may be the same person that somebody at the archives told me about last last couple of years. Um, but you'd have to be able to match it up to somebody else, and that's the problem. We don't, you know, what are we what are we going to match it to in those years? We don't have lots of sources. So if we don't have any more questions, I'd, I'd like to thank Anne um, for such an interesting presentation. And I, I wish you would publish it. You know, I'm sure University Studies will be glad to have it. <laughs> Well, I can think about that. I have two more promised lectures on New Jersey suffrage, so I may not want it published yet. <laughs> that used to be a thing that Stan and Anthony worried about. They wouldn't let anybody publish their le their talk if they're going to. That's their lecture for that season. They don't want everybody reading it and not coming to hear them. So, um, I'm, I'm not giving the identical one, but I have to be careful what I'm going to try to do. Okay. Here's one more question. Okay. Um, if women could, said women can write, could write wills in colonial West Jersey, did they lose that right um, at any point? I don't know the answer to that. We need Maxine Curie. Where's Maxine? Well, I saw Jonathan's here, but where I don't know if Maxine is here. <laughs> 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 um, I. Uh, Okay, well, thank you all for coming. This has been a great audience. We had 85 people. At, really? At, <laughs> well, I'm sorry I couldn't see you all. <laughs> yeah, but we're actually going to have a, um, a program about the Roebling family later, later in November, and we also have the Book Arts Symposium coming up. So Special Collections will be, be having programming um, Online programming will continue even in this situation of pandemic. <laughs> so, thanks again. Um, well, thank you for organizing this. You're welcome. Inviting me. It was my pleasure. <laughs> <laughs>